let's move into the very first one of sleep because I said I think this is now this is your your learner objective number four that we have was that I said we're going to learn some strategies and that's always what people are mostly interested in they're like hurry up and get to that point okay so we're going to get to that point and I'll try to expound out on some of this with you and I think what I might want to do in this this Hopefully it's going to work because David's not here. You guys stay put. I'm going to show you. We need Dave for the video. We do need him. Okay. We'll wait then. We've got time. I was going to show you Cooper dysregulated so that you'd have him in your head as we're talking about this. But we'll, we'll see him enough. It'll, it'll make sense. So we're going to look at things for sleep assistance. We're going to look at behavioral supports for this group of kids, calming tricks, and we're going to talk about pretend play and why pretend play is so important for these group of kids. All right, here's what you have to ask yourself. Do you observe any of these sleep issues? A lot of our kids, again, remember, sleep in the same room that they're playing in. They sleep in the same room that they have their lunch in. The bathroom's in this room for some of our families. These are the questions that we have to ask ourselves, okay? Are you seeing where the child may not be cuddly? Why, why do I care about that? Stop and think a minute. Why do I care if he's a cuddly child? Sense of touch, I just heard. And if you're cuddly, what do you do? You mold into your caretaker. You get that warm nurturance and support. And do you remember when I picked up my little Raggedy Ann doll and I said early on, well, not only during feeding, but what do we do? How do we self-soothe babies? Okay. If I'm not the cuddly one and I'm pulling away all of the time, it's probably going to be one of those kids who have that body that I talked about that's out more like this. The touch me not. Mm, I don't like how that feels. So think about your emotional brain, the limbic system. Here they come. They want to hug me. Mm, the amygdala says, I don't like it. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Yeah. Do you see kids that have both? Yes. In other words, sometimes... They want the hug. Yes. Sometimes they're like, don't bother me. Yes, because then they're probably in a regulated state. See, because they don't stay okay. even keel. So they may want it one day, but not the next. They may want it from grandma, but not this person. And that's what gets so complex with these kids because they'll behave differently sometimes with different people and in different environments. Cooper is totally different with me than he is with his mom. He's totally different. He just started preschool there than he is in other environments. 13 kids, Julie one-on-one. -on -one. Do you see how it fluctuates on these group of kids? So it, if it's a skills issue, then how could, okay, if, if a child can self-regulate in one environment but not in another, we're not talking about the skill set then, are we? Do, do. Not sure what you mean by skill set. I'm sorry? Not, not sure what you mean by skill set. Just in like, other words, knowing how to um, self-calm. And in other words, in, in one environment, the child is able to maintain, um, mm -hmm. self-calm, um, think of other strategies, whatever. But in another environment, they don't do that at all. And probably what you, what you could be seeing in those environments, and, and again, we, we won't have the opportunity to talk about this, but you have things called sensory processing issues. You do have behavioral issues. You have social emotional components to a lot of this mm -hmm. so some environments if a child is self-regulating in some and not in others it could be the environmental supports for that child hope this makes sense to you are greater in this environment with grandma than it is in this environment mm -hmm. with my mom or my peers maybe mom talks too fast maybe mom moves too quickly Grandmas tend to be more, what, slower paced, you hang back more. And so it could be that the supports that the children are getting, environment to environment, and that's a key thing that we talk a lot about, is the environments that these children are in can set them off so easily. And so that's what makes us so hard, and that's the whole detective work. Well, how come you're okay at home, but you're awful here? You have kids who can hold it together at school, Right. Okay, but fall apart at home. And we have that happen a lot. Okay? 
because that could be your child who has third order abilities and knows I have to do this, I have to do this, but that emotional brain isn't supported, so when they get home, they do what? Fall apart. Just like what we do. It's, we, the we can, it's the limbic system. We can talk ourselves through things as adults. When we're upset, we have all these strategies and things, and we can do it if we're in a social environment. We know we better not fly off the handle because you got mad at what your husband or your whatever did. Like, okay, I'll get you later. Right? And so you get home, and you're like, <laughs> poke you in the eye so <laughs> but you see that so you kind of but then you fall apart and that happens to our kids that's what makes us so so hard so hard and one of the biggest things is us staying you know did you guys get that we have to stay calm it is one of the hardest things and you guys as parents and teachers, again, are already doing the next thing before this ended. You guys have to stay in third order all day. <laughs> and so it's so hard to T-E-A-C-H this group of kids because we're already having to take care of the next thing, okay? So think about how that affects kids who are dysregulated. Okay, it's, it's not as easy. I said, we're doing some real common and easy things here. It's really pretty complex. It really is for this group of kids. And, and here's part of the reason, too, because maybe with sleep issues and not even sleep but moving around, children cannot screen out noises. I've had parents tell me I can get them to bed and I can get them asleep, and they'll say, I swear, Julie, I'll open up the potato chip bag, and they wake up. <laughs> they can hear everything. Okay, so they do not get a good, good night's sleep. I have children that literally do that, okay? Is the child easily aroused by movement? Does he have difficulty getting settled in? Is he agitated by bed sheets? Doesn't want them off, pushes them off, doesn't want the pajamas on? Um, this happens a lot. They want the body contact of a caregiver next to them, or they want the constant patting and the stroking. Yeah, and, they, and, if, and if they let go, while sleeping. They, they wake, wake up. up. Full wake. They wake up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they have a specific routine that they want to do before they wake up. Right. And that, that whole waking up thing with sleeping, those are boundaries you have kids. And, and I think in our slides we have a couple of these that sleep on the floor on a mattress. Have you had parents tell you that? That, no, he's on the floor on a mattress. Children who sleep in tents. Um, I recommend a lot of times to our families buying body pillows for some of our kids and decreasing the space of that bed because you're wanting the contact and this isn't in my slide but a good way to transition children from the hand on them and the padding okay so that's already been established right and that's their routine and there you are <laughs> and you're <laughs> stuck and you want that coffee so you're sitting there thinking I got to get out of here but I can't you take an object you start transitioning an object next to them i.e. a body pillow a stuffed animal and what they're looking for is that pressure on their body to know where they are, okay? And so you start moving items in there and you transition that touch to an object or the wall. You get them against a wall. The bed is not out in space. It has to be against a wall. So then as he moves, what does he get? Contact, contact. And that's what some of those children are looking for is body contact. Okay, so that's a little strategy for some of the sleep to transition from having to do this all the time or a hand on them as you start using an object, stuffed animals, some pillows if it's safe, tucking them in tight. I always have teachers say, oh my gosh, I got to put him in the sleeping bag. You have the kids who put um, sheets over their heads when they sleep, okay? They're looking for that tight <coughs> space because what is calming? <laughs> Why do I want that tight space? As a therapist, the word is flexion, okay? How do we calm ourselves, right? We curl up. We don't lay across our bed like this, <laughs> right? We come in, we put blankets on us. You might at the end of the day with these kids. With all, with all these kids. <laughs> True. Only if you're hot. But that's what they're looking for. Bring my body in, body contact. Okay, so look and see if you're seeing these, these issues with those group of kids. For my parents, and you can ask them those questions. If you don't, 
If you don't have naps at your daycare or your schools, you can still ask your parents these questions, okay? And that's gonna tell you a little bit about the kids. Now you have two types of sleepers. We've got the signalers and we've got the self-soothers. I am a signal, signaler, <laughs> it's a hard word to say, if I go to bed with, without a sleep aid, okay? If I'm already asleep when you put me down and they cry when they wake up, so they're gonna signal you. The self-soothers use a sleep aid, thumb, bottle, toy, you can put them to bed awake probably because they have a sleep aid, <laughs> okay? Whereas the other ones reject it. They don't have anything to use. Self-soothers will return to sleep on their own. So they wake up, but they go back to sleep, okay? Read this slide, <laughs> okay? The number of times these two wake up do not differ. But us as caregivers of the poor sleeper feel like <laughs> they wake up more because we have to go help them. So they rely on us more, okay? They wake up the same amount of time, but your self-soothers don't need you, <laughs> okay? They use an aid or they may not necessarily have an aid, but they can get their body back to a calm state, all right? So I thought this was interesting. When I was doing all my background on all this and checking, I thought, oh my gosh, this is so true. You feel like you're constantly with those ones, okay? But it really doesn't differ. One's taking care of their needs, the other ones aren't, okay? So here's what it looks like. <laughs> so you have to think about it. Which one do you have? <laughs> Aw. <laughs> Here. The nice non judgmental word, it's, signalers. Yes, they're signalers. Here's Cooper. Um, this is at his house and his mom, as we got to talking about things. He likes to crash into these pillows also, but she found out that he started developing this on his own that he was, when he would watch TV. And you see what all he has? He has a stuffed animal, he has a blankie, and he has all of his pillows off of the couch. So he's learning to be a self-soother. He's taking care of himself. And so mom is like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> We're getting some more homeostasis with him. He's eating better. He's sleeping better. He's taking care of himself. I don't have to be around him as much, okay? So Cooper started coming up with this on his own. And so now she's starting to cocoon him even more in his bed. He had a very large bed. Mom now has it against the wall. We've enclosed that space for Cooper and he's doing a much better job with sleep. Okay, so just a picture. So some of this we've already talked a little bit about. Here are some strategies. And again, you guys, if you don't, if, if you're at a, a daycare, you're at a school and you don't do napping, these are still things you can talk to your parents about because why? You want them to come. <laughs> that next day having rested. It's gonna help those behaviors when you get a good night's sleep. So here are some of the things that, that we have found have, used, have worked very nicely to help our children start self-soothing and get better sleep quality. A mattress on the floor and obviously away from doors because remember one of the early signs was there's sometimes hypersensitivity to noise for these kids, so they wake up easy. So you wanna have this group of children obviously farther away from where you're having to move in and out of the classroom or wherever it is that you're helping children. Sometimes the use of the sleeping bag gives you neutral warmth, gives you boundaries, gives you some weight, as opposed to just using a sheet. And that natural warmth allows the body neurologically to go, ah, unless you run hot. <laughs> a small tent on the floor, we have found, has been a very nice solution for a lot of these children because it shuts down all the stimulus that has been going on throughout the day. It is totally, totally different having an enclosed space. We've even used canopies where you drop down a blanket and you decrease this big, in, this big space here. 
okay? So you try to create more of what we call womb environments. And a womb environment is what? Children had movement in the womb, but there's a little bit of containment, right, from our abdominals, okay? So we've got some containment. So we try to create little womb environments for these group of kids to kind of slow down, shut down all the stimulation, and relax. So tents will work well for that. Uh, white noise in the background. Um, there's this one CD called Cool Bananas that I've recommended for families, and I've had teachers put this on um, in their classrooms. I've got a reference on it, but it's a wonderful CD that brings heart rate and heartbeat down slower and slower. You have to use it continually. You can't do it once and say it doesn't work. You play the CD and you keep playing it and you keep playing it. It is a wonderful, wonderful CD to help children get to sleep on their own. We've got it referenced. Um, this to me is common sense, security object at bedtime. Here comes my butt. <laughs> and teachers get mad at me. But how many kids bring things from home? especially my kids who have social emotional issues, kids who are scared, kids in general. They want those security items and we take it away from them, okay? That's that part where I say you're working on, they use that as their mom. Think about it, I want my mom, I want my mom to help me, I want my friend to help me, I want bunny, poo poo, foo foo, whoever with me. And we always say, don't bring anything from home. Now, there's a neat way to get around this. It's called Tupperware. Because what you can do right. is they bring it. They still want to see it, OK? Maybe you don't necessarily want them to have that at this time or that time. But you can say, guess what? Here's a place for Bunny Foo Foo. He's going to be right here. Let's put him safe. And they can see it throughout the day. There may be times that you can say, let's go get Bunny. Let's go get whatever it is your toy is. But if you have a clear Tupperware, they feel safer. They're like, oh my gosh, you're letting me bring it. I feel so much better, okay? I feel so much better bringing my water, okay? We bring things every day to our jobs. You know, we have things that give us comfort. And then we take three and four year olds who are in your, you know, from six to six away from their moms and we don't let them have an object. Okay, so really think about that, you guys. This is something I'm really strongly feel about. Is we've we've got to give them some of that. Um, yeah, not as a reward. No, it's a strategy, <coughs> support. It's a support, and that's how that's how I always look at it. Is this is a support? Because I'm not doing a behavioral management to say if you behave, I'm going to give you this. Because if he could behave, he would. <laughs> he would. Do you see what my point as an OT? I would if I could, I can't, okay? So uh, peekaboo and hide and seek, you guys. Some of these kids have separation anxieties. Fun game to play, tell mom and dad. I want you to start doing that. Where's mom and dad? Play peekaboo, hide and seek because there's separation anxiety. So you can always do like, I want you to go home and just play this, okay? Then I can locate my mom and I know where she is. You know, it's the old out of sight, out of mind, <laughs> object permanence. <laughs> You're still here, and I can find you. So that's a strategy. I know where you are, all right? I can go get my help. Uh, avoid active playtime. Darken the room. Uh, into, in the, introduce visually calming activities prior to nap as part of your routine, and we're going to have a calming section, so we'll talk about that. There's this neat book. Wait a minute. I went too far. Go, 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 stop is a, a really nice book related to cars and trucks and the car goes too fast and they have to stop and how does the truck take time out and relax. So it's a real fun book you could read before nap time to children. Um, and that's a, there's a lot of stuff out there. If you just kind of Google some items along those lines, it would be fun to read. All right. So ask yourself, do I help support <laughs> self-regulation of the sleep-wake cycles by getting nap times established, do I have rituals and routines, and do I allow a calming device? Okay, those are kind of the key things that I think are important because so many children sleep on this. Is it up there? It is now. 
They sleep on cots. That's why I don't go camping. <laughs> I think of you guys, you're, we're putting them on hard, hard surfaces. And how do you nest? How do you get into a womb space, not on a cot? So I have to have something else that's going to bring me into that self-soothing position. All right? Sleep is so, so important for this group of kids. All right? Here's this little, just shows you a CD of the cool bananas in the book, uh, Go, 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 that I love to use. Now, um, and this is a strategy that his mom initially began to use because Cooper would not ask for help. Remember, Cooper's my screamer. He screams at everything. He bolts. He runs. He throws himself down on the floor. He throws toys. So one of the first things we did was a behavioral support for him. And it's a simple picture card. So I'm going to show you what this picture card looks like, and I'm going to show you that it doesn't necessarily work when you first introduce it because they get mad at you. Because you're telling them you can be mad, you can be sad, you can't kick, hit, or scream, you can ask me for help. So we make this little, and you'll get to see it on the video, you'll see this picture. So mom's going, Cooper, Cooper, what's Miss Julie's sign? He's like, ah, don't tell me! <laughs> so this is when she first introduces it. When you introduce these cards, kids will throw them, kids will rip them, <laughs> because they don't want to see it, okay? So, let me show you the first time it happens. So, this is her beginning to introduce it. <laughs> He's upset. Oh, Cooper, what does your sign say? <laughs> what does, what does Miss Julie's sign say? Okay.